bonjour, or good morning, my friends. Today, we're going to be going over part one of a probably 10 to 11 part series going over all of the Tyranid High Fleets. Today, we're going over my absolute favorite, High Fleet Tiamat, and essentially what's going on on the jungle world of Zeophoria. I know for a lot of you, the name Zeophoria is going to mean nothing, but if you have looked at the 40k iceberg at the very, very bottom, it is what the Tyranids are building on that jungle world. So, for old time's sake, we're going to be remaking those videos and trying to make them a lot more organized. So we're of course going to start off with the Imperial Records first, starting with the first documented encounter and all the later expeditions. Then we're going to go on to the Eldari and their Faded Expedition, and then give a little perspective on the Necron, and end it off with a bunch of theories on the system and what's going on with it currently. First Contact Now, according to the mainstream Imperial records, the first encounter with the Tyranid Menace happened sometime in M41.745 in the far galactic east, where High Fleet Behemoth made contact with the planet of Tyran. High Fleet Behemoth was believed to be the initial contact between what was then believed to be a federation of Xeno species that made up the Tyranids. However, pretty quickly the assumptions of a Xenos federation were proven wrong and the idea of a hive mind came forward. The first Tyrannic Wars technically began on the planet of Tyran, but it was only after they kept pushing west into the galactic east, yes I know it's confusing, but just stay with me, and they made their push into the realm of Ultramar did the first Tyrannic War really start to pick up. The Tyranids essentially just made a beeline straight for McCrag, and every single planet in its way was atomized. Only the combined efforts of the entire Blue Boy Scout Brigade and all of their successor chapters were able to actually mount a defense on McCrag, also known as the legally distinct Space Athens. But uh, all of this isn't true. High Fleet Behemoth happened like four or five hundred years after the first actual documented encounter with the Tyranids. I don't want to say that the Imperium is outright lying, because again, this is a galaxy-spanning empire and entire worlds can starve with just a single piece of missigned paper, so, you know, an expedition 400-500 years ago being lost really isn't that surprising. People seem to forget the most basic things, and forgetting why this system is quarantined doesn't really seem pertinent, especially in M41. If a system says do not go in, uh, you have to be either extremely dumb or unable to read, which realistically both of them are equally possible. All of this began actually six to seven thousand years ago, depending on which side of the galaxy you're on and how you actually keep track of time, in M35.745. A Mechanicus Explorator fleet departing from the Forge world of Triplex Fall entered the Tiamat system for the first time. The crew on board were met with a rather standard looking solar system with binary stars. Real fast binary stars is when you just have two stars orbiting the center of a solar system as opposed to our one star. Think of Tatooine from Star Wars, that's just the most recognizable binary star system in sci-fi. But back to Tiamat. It was found that orbiting the twin stars were seven distinct life-bearing worlds, as well as countless protoplanets and other much less important celestial bodies. The strangest thing about the system, however, was that each of those seven worlds had a distinct biome that stretched from pole to pole. All seven of the planets, despite having completely different environments on them, all had strikingly similar reports of hostile wildlife that seemed to act as one, where the planet itself seemed to be reacting to their presence. Now, death worlds are nothing new to the Imperium, but to have seven death worlds in one system is pretty abnormal. Add to that that every single creature between all seven of these worlds share a common ancestor. Whether they are fish on an ocean world or birds on a jungle planet, they all had a common ancestor. This, while being weird, isn't unheard of. The galaxy is a very large and very old place. Anything that can happen will happen, so at first nobody really paid too much mind. As if the swarms of biting insects and the near constant attacks from local wildlife life wasn't enough, the entire system, it seemed, had decided the fleet had overstayed their welcome. Simultaneously, across all seven of the worlds, all matter of deadly creatures, be it microbe or mammoth, bird or bug, entire biospheres began to advance upon the explorator ships with a malice unseen since the Great Crusade. 
The crew that was stationed upon the jungle world of Zeophoria even claimed that a giant tendril, like that of a great kraken of Fenris, reached out from the earth in an effort to deny the trespassers their escape. Where before the attack of entire biospheres, the surveyors were in debate on classifying the entire system as uninhabitable due to every major planet being a death world. Now, after the sudden change in the local fauna's aggression, the entire system would be cordoned off. A quarantine was set in place for those who survived this cursed expedition, as they could contain seeds or spores of whatever blight had turned an entire solar system into a living nightmare. For just under a week, the Explorator fleet maintained their quarantine, all while relaying as much information to the wider Imperium as was physically possible. On the sixth day, however, the last transmission was sent, and the Explorator fleet would be absorbed into this living system. Before we go into the next expedition that's done by the Filthy Knife Ears, I want to really go over everything we learned from this actual first encounter. So in M35, which, keep in mind, is 5,000 years after the Horus Heresy, 5,000 years, maybe 4,000 years after uh, Barabbas D'Antioch and Alexis Pollux had the incident with the Pharaoh speaking, and this is anywhere between 6 and 7,000 years before the next Tyranid encounter with High Fleet Behemoth. So some 6,000 years before the first Tyrannic War, the Tyranid organism was just chilling in the eastern fringe, most likely adapting the seven planets of the system into the most common ecosystems that are found within the Milky Way. Now, accounts start to lose chronological order here on out, so I will try my best to clarify when events happen if I know, but no promises. Following the initial quarantine, future expeditions weren't officially endorsed, but nonetheless, countless trader vessels and merchant fleets went silent in a sphere that seemed suspiciously centered on the quarantine system of Tiamat. When the Eldari finally arrived to investigate what would later be known as the Shadow in the Warp in this area, of the galaxy, we know that the planet of Zeophoria was outputting so much psychic noise that multiple of the filthy knife ears on this expedition straight up convulsed and some of them were near incapacitated. The knife ears didn't even need to land on the planet of Zeophoria to notice an organism the size of a continent made of writhing chitin and flesh that quickly took notice of the trespassers and once again the entire system began to react. Where previously the world of Zeophoria had been the typical jungle death world, now the entire surface of the planet writhed and hummed in unison. The tendril that had reached out to grab the Explorator fleet some 6,000 years ago had now been replaced with a fleet of gnashing void bugs, looking to punish any trespasser and add the biomass and genetic data to its extra galactic gene banks. What the Eldari observed would later be called Tyranoforming. This tyranoforming process is what happens when an entire planet, including its atmosphere, is turned essentially into a symbiotic biosphere. Soon after the Eldari expedition, a Death Watch kill team led by a Sergeant Yunheim departed from the aptly named Death Watch Fortress of Haltmoat under the pretense of investigating anomalous seismic activity as well as the amount of disappearances in the space surrounding the Tiamat system. Now, Unlike the extremely sensitive elves, the Death Watch managed to actually make contact with this continent-spanning supercreature, though it soon became clear that what was previously seen as anomalous seismic activity was actually convulsions of this continent-spanning supercreature. Upon noticing this kill team, the continent-sized bug decided to let out a psychic scream that was so loud that the librarian in the kill team was just outright atomized. Following the psychic screech, all of High Fleet Tiamat turned heel and raced towards the trespassers on Zeophoria. As if frying the brain of the team's librarian wasn't enough, massive fleshy spires tore through the planet's crust and began to grow even higher into the atmosphere, with each one of these spires acting as an amplifier for the creature's psychic whales. Following the loss of this kill team, the Ordo Xenos decided to do the most Ordo Xeno thing possible and just fusion bomb the planets into hell. But this didn't seem to do anything except turn everything blue. Which, you know, that's cool I guess, blue's awesome. But just knowing that they're blue doesn't really help the Imperium understand why there's an entire solar system angry at them and what the Tyranids are doing there. The Ordo Xeno is now under the impression that Zeophoria was a latent psychic beacon or the equivalent of a seed or egg. But now we're gonna swap off from the most brutal regime imaginable to something that's somehow even worse. 
the Necron. We've gotten the perspective of humanity and the Mechanicus, as well as the testimony of the Eldari. Now, let's hear the description from the most ancient race in this galaxy. To quote the Necron, While the majority of the Necron race slept away the Aeon, his majesty Zarek, the Silent King, journeyed far and wide beyond the borders of this galaxy. Such unspeakable things did he witness as cannot be adequately articulated in our noble language, nor any other. The most dire of all extragalactic enemies were the Tyranids. Now I know the Necron perspective here sounds kinda weird because we're talking solely about High Fleet Tiamat, but considering this is the first episode in the series, I really want to give perspective onto essentially how much the Necron opinion of the Tyranids actually matters. Now I have to talk about the War in Heaven, skip ahead a few minutes if you already know all about the War in Heaven, but the not so quick and the real dirty of it is that the previous quote is coming from the Necron, beings that have been around since 65 million years ago and have killed multiple different classifications of gods, not just creator deities, but destruction deities as well. 65 million years ago, the Necron went to war with the Eldari and the Old Ones, as well as all of the other creations that they made, and they won. They killed the gods of the Eldari. They killed the gods that made humanity, or at least set the blueprints for humanity. Then, after that, they decided that the gods that they had allied with weren't that cool anymore, so they killed them and took their powers. So this isn't just some random race saying that the Tyranids are a big threat. This is a race that has killed multiple gods and has decided that the Tyranids are somehow worse than the star god Catan and the old ones who actually created the Eldar, the Krork, and humanity, who created essentially every piece of recognizable life within this galaxy. Add to that, the Necrons literally completed technology. They finished technology and decided, yeah, we're gonna take a nap. If they didn't decide to take this nap, the Necron, for a fact, would own this galaxy. All of that was essentially just to put into perspective that the strongest being from the strongest race to ever exist has decided that the Tyranid Menace is the scariest thing his species has ever seen. When the Necrons say that the Tyranids are the number one threat, this cannot be overstated. This is the race that has seen the most and the scariest things in the galaxy. Now, the Necron haven't actually had much interaction with High Fleet Tiamat, but that's because their awakening happened largely after M35. Yeah, there were a couple of dynasties that were awake, namely Trizin and whatever his entourage was doing, but the vast majority of the Necron species had been asleep for some 65 million years. But now that we've gone over all the different perspectives and what we know about High Fleet Tiamat, now we get to go into the theories, and I'll kind of rate them on how likely I think they are, and how creative I think they are. Theory 1 is probably the most widely accepted and the most widely known theory, and it's simply that a seed was planted in the Tiamat system after the hive mind noticed the incident with the pharaoh speaking. With how slow the Tyranids travel and how fast they adapt, it makes sense that they would need a quote-unquote training ground or something of the sort. What better of a lure for the species of the galaxy than a system with seven habitable planets with minimal terraforming? This would act as a perfect bait for the organics of the universe who have a never-ending thirst for resources and a reason for fighting each other. If this is a species that has conquered at least one galaxy, which is what has been heavily implied, they would have the knowledge and genetic diversity of a trillion stars, each one of those trillion stars acting as a cradle for life. The Tyranid hive mind as a whole should have access to billions of years of cumulative time from all of the organics that they would have subsumed. Billions of years of adapting and climbing Darwin's 13.7 billion year old corpse pile, each with their own strategies and technologies that the Tyranids have designed entire organs and organelles around. Entire starship sized banks of knowledge, computation, and production are the norm for the Tyranids, since they don't need technology. Considering how slow that the Nids actually travel, taking a few thousand years for them to find a backwater system in the galactic east and actually set up a seed there, it actually makes perfect sense. They have time. The galaxy just experienced the single largest civil war in thousands and thousands of years. Keep in mind that the Tyranids are an exponential threat. 
If the Explorator fleet that arrived in M35 had arrived a few thousand years sooner, maybe the Nids wouldn't have had enough of a foothold for them to be a major problem and the fusion bombing that the Ordo Xenos later ordered would have done something other than just turn them blue. But since we don't have an actual definitive date for when the Tyranids even showed up here, we can't rule this one out. I'm gonna put this one at likely maybe a 7 out of 10 because it's the simplest explanation and, you know, it. Knowing GW, this is what they're going to go with. Theory number two is what I like to call the red marker. This theory, I think, comes from someone trying to find a way to merge Dead Space and 40k. But I'll still try to give it my best description. So, we know the original origin story of the Gene Stealers involves Xeophoria heavily, and it goes as follows. Soon after the Psychic Screech and the spires that would amplify the Psychic Beacon coming off from Xeophoria, a heretical cult hailing from Heinrich's March made a holy pilgrimage to the Living Planet. As soon as those pilgrims made contact with the planet, they were instantly subsumed by the will of the hive mind, and they turned on their compatriots, encouraging them to spread the will of the four-armed emperor among the stars. This one, despite being really, really simplistic, does give us some concrete lore on the origins of gene stealers, or at least gene stealers amongst humanity, because we don't know if this acted as the catalyst for gene stealers amongst other species. Maybe there were pilgrimages from other planets, from other species, we don't know. Despite all that though, I do think this is one of the more likely ones, since if you are an extragalactic intelligence who has already subsumed all of the knowledge of a galaxy, you would know what a galactic superpower is, and you would essentially put your psychic beacon on the exact opposite end of the galaxy from that superpower. Add to that, we get a mix between Dead Space and 40k, and uh, I'm gonna give this one like an 8 or a 9, because, uh, I, I don't know, it's just cool. Theory 3 is the modified seed theory, and it is arguably my favorite theory, and it goes that essentially the entire galaxy was already harvested by the Tyranids, and they left a dormant seed somewhere in the Tiamat system. This theory is probably the least supported theory, but we can use the fact that the Swarm Lord has a material that is not found in the Milky Way, one of the interpretations of that is that they already harvested the Milky Way, and all of that material has been harvested. It makes sense that we don't find it in our galaxy because they already took all of it. There are really only two ways that this could work, one of them being that they had already eaten the galaxy before the Necrons and the Old Ones even arose, which, you know, I guess that would make sense. Or alternatively, as one of the last Old Ones was dying, he decided to throw a Hail Mary and just make a super virus. The theory where they harvested the galaxy over 66 million years ago is really interesting because it implies that the Old Ones essentially found an empty galaxy and they assumed, oh, the Tyranids just completely wiped it clean. Why would there be anything left? And they took their almost god status and that made them actual gods of this galaxy. That would also make sense why the Catan existed because the Tyranids would gain actually nothing from eating the Catan. They were star gods at this point. They didn't even have Necrodermis bodies. Those were given to them millions and millions of years later by the Necron Tyr. I personally think that the Tyranids harvesting the galaxy before the Old Ones arrived is significantly more likely, but I still think that the other one is possible, so we're gonna put the Harvested the Galaxy before the Old Ones at like an 8 out of 10, because that one is really likely and really possible, and then the other one that they are just a Hail Mary from the Old Ones, we're gonna give that like a 3 out of 10, because they could have done much better. And uh, lastly, the final theory is that uh, the universe is all Tyranids, essentially every single galaxy out there is Tyranids. Again, there's no real evidence for this one, but this is one of the cooler cosmic horror aspects because we don't know who created them when, we just know that they have existed forever and they will exist forever. They're essentially a universal constant. All there is is Tyranids and all there will be is Tyranids. I guess the logical conclusion for this theory is that the Tyranids are going to become either the Chaos God of Unity, or they are going to just suffocate Chaos by making everything one intelligence, one transcendent being. This one is uh, probably the best cosmic horror one, so it gets a 10 out of 10 in that aspect, because, you know, everything being Tyranids is, is pretty scary. It takes a, you know, there's nothing but war in this galaxy to all there is is war, period. Also, them being in the void of space makes sense. If they had previously harvested a galaxy, they would be sending out tendrils to other galaxies or proto-galaxies at the same time. Them investing all of their resources into the Milky Way isn't practical. 
Alternatively, we have the situation where this is just a war game that needed a devouring swarm like all space games and movies of the era. Think the Zerg, the Flood, the Borg, the Prothorian Scourge. Hell, even the Xenomorphs. The 80s and 90s sci-fi were the golden age of horny and hungry aliens that are scary looking. Think Alien, Predator, or Starcraft. However you spin it, GW just wanted to fit in and put their own, you know, little twist on it. Think of the orcs from Tolkien, and now think of the orcs in 40k completely different despite sharing basically the same name. Now I know that the last one I said was going to be the last, but this is the most likely of all the theories, and this is just from a world building perspective, this is the most meta perspective. Essentially the Tyranids are the exact opposite of the Necrons. The Necron and the Tyranids are the exact same thing, just extrapolated in opposite directions. The Necrons largely have already achieved what the Tyranids want. If you think back to After the War in Heaven, Zarek had complete control over the Necron species, or 99.9% .9 of it, with the command protocols. You could make a solid argument that right before Zarek, you know, relinquished the controls of the command protocols, that the Necron species was a hive mind. Compare that to now, where it is essentially 99% of the Necron species are soulless husks who are trying to gain their individuality. Compare that to the Tyranids, who are a living being who is trying to make all of them into one singular consciousness. But yeah, that's about it. it. It's really just the Necrons and the Tyranids are the exact opposite, and I think they were created, or at least theorycrafted, at the exact same time. Because from a world-building perspective, why would you have two species or two factions which are the exact opposite to one another? Not, you know, oh, they're a little bit different. They are the exact opposite, the exact anathema. I don't know, I, I think I just like this one because it's very poetic. The ultimate quest for unity and the ultimate quest for individuality.